Hello class, welcome to this week's lecture where we will talk about how to leverage convolution in neural networks to deal with image prediction tasks. So over the last few weeks during this course, we've built up from very simple techniques, how to store data, how to visualize it, how to represent it in feature vectors, how do we deal with text, um, how do we feed all this text in traditional classification and regression techniques, when do we choose what type of model? Hybrid models seem to perform better. Sometimes we need a comprehensible model though, so this is a balance we need to take into account. And now these last few weeks we've moved more into the domain uh, that has been under heavy development the last five to ten years, which is neural networks and more specifically deep neural networks. Um, while we've talked about word embeddings, how to represent text, this week is going to handle more about how to represent um, multidimensional data. And this means uh, images, uh, even videos, although we're not going to be practicing that, uh, time series. How do we deal with um, input in which the representations and the, 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 the relationships within the representation are important. For that, we use convolutional neural networks. So convolutional neural networks really first application was images representation. So let's have a look at how do we represent images. So as I mentioned, we've dealt with simple numbers, time series, text, uh, but how really do we represent images? So when we have these convolutional neural networks, this will enable us to do some computer vision tasks. What kind of tasks are there in computer vision? Because I say, if I say computer vision, really it means to represent images and videos uh, on a computer. Uh, these days the field implies that you're using neural networks, but that's really not always the case. Some of the tasks related to data science that they do is, let's say, image, image classification. This is the easiest one, let's say. Here, you want to know what the image is on the left. Okay, so we have a chair. Is this a chair or not? Then you want a slightly more complex task. We can do image classification and localizing. Okay, so here is an object and it is a chair. Mm -hmm. Object detection, okay, there's an object, here's a tree, here's a chair, etc. Okay, so multiple objects in one, um, in one image. Then the last sort of the complex tasks in this is image segmentation, where you're going to be predicting a map uh, that shows you where exactly the entire image is. So not just the bounding box, but the entire uh, image map. And if you're, rep if you're interested in how this sort of prediction task looks like, is here our input will f be the pixels of the image, our output will be sort of a map. We call it a map. It can be a binary map, which means it's zero, zero, zero if there's no chair, and it's, it'll be one, one where there is a chair. And that's sort of if we color it and we overlay it over the original image, it will segment nicely where the chair is. So these kinds of binary masks, or if they're not binary, we refer to them as soft masks. That means they can be actual double uh, numbers. Uh, often you start in your training set to, to create uh, binary masks, because in our original ground truth label, we would know where the chair is. So we just put zeros and one. And when we predict, one possible way is to get a probability for each pixel, is it a chair or not? So it will be a soft mask that you're actually generating. Okay, so the, you train on binary mask and you predict soft masks. All right, so image classification is very useful in the whole field of data science, uh, and it just means classifying images into one or more categories. So we can also have multi-label classification, a little bit harder to evaluate. Uh, well, because you can't use the standard um, cross-entropy loss, you have to think a little bit about how many categories do you allow, can you, what if you have, what if an image belongs to two categories in your data set, but your algorithm predicts a third, and how do you uh, quantify how accurate this classification is? Okay. 
So there are some other strategies for multi-label classification. Um, we're not going to be dealing with that right now. Training data must have images labeled with their class. So it can be hard to find a data set, but very often people use a Mechanical Turk for instance, which is a, a paid service by Amazon, there's other alternatives as well, um, to have volunteers label data. Okay. CAPTCHAs, you may not know this, but uh, companies are actually using CAPTCHAs, you know, the things that you, you, it used to be the numbers that you have to type in from the image before you can log on some site. Uh, they actually only evaluated half of the numbers you give in and used the other half to um, populate a data set. Okay. So that's due to your help now that we have big data sets. So there's a bunch of challenges in images. Okay. So we can have uh, some of the challenges are, are, are depicted here, uh, but also think of, you know, in self-driving uh, vehicles we have you know a, a photo of a street can look so many different ways there could be a lot of object variation it's raining it's light the sun is shining it's cloudy uh, there's some tree shade covering the image uh, they can have different types of illumination there can be an object half in front of an object how do we deal with that and there can be a bunch of background clutter just some of the examples of challenges in images. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so I should say that um, when we move into the domain of convolutional neural networks, we're going to be touching a lot on the area of deep learning, okay? Why is that? Because really convolutional neural networks are part of what made deep learning possible. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that when we start talking about Lynette and the first deep architectures uh, in a little bit. Okay. While as a data scientist, right, obviously we have to keep our problem statement uh, in mind. So it's important to keep thinking of things like challenges, image augmentation, not just the techniques and the technologies that you're implementing. That said, if you're a data scientist, you really can't imagine not uh, not knowing about convolutional neural networks or, or some basics of deep learning when choosing your model. Luckily, we have some tools that make it very easy for us um, to implement all of these uh, convolutional neural networks, such as Keras, PyTorch, and the like. Fast AI, another example of how it's becoming more and more easy to implement these deep neural networks. Right. So deep learning with convolutional neural networks or CNNs, convolutional neural networks, is really everywhere, right? So much of the information on the internet is being used, labeled uh, to, to enable all sorts of models for speech recognition, image classification, etc. Okay. Um, also for language, which I think Professor Yanya will talk to you about, is uh, it is possible to leverage 1D convolutional neural networks for speech and text uh, representations. Okay. Actually, I'll talk a little bit about speech, but he'll talk about how to represent words with 1D convolution. Okay. Um, we move to medicine. We can do um, x-ray analysis. I think I saw some data set on Kaggle about using x-rays uh, classify between COVID or non-COVID x-rays. Um, do cancer cell detection, uh, all sorts of medical images. I'm honestly not really sure what's in this picture. Um, okay, if you know, let me know. Uh, media and entertainment, of course. Uh, w people examine what you're looking for, what you're looking at when you watch YouTube movies, when the kind of images you see, uh, everything's being analyzed. In security or defense, uh, there's a lot of phase detection going on. Actually, even in media and entertainment, phase detection is going on because there's some apps like if you, you know, if you have, you're in a taxi, you're watching advertisements, uh, it can do phase detect. There's some people developing apps to do phase detection to see if you're happy with the app that's being played or not. Okay. 
And then there's autonomous vehicles. Obviously, there's a lot uh, of computer vision happening and CNNs are key in representing all these things. So when you know a little bit about AI, you know that uh, the whole field, AI, deep learning, machine learning, it's all so related, right? Uh, and you know that AI actually was first developed in the 50s. Then after a while of being popular, it sort of hit uh, neural networks, kind of got uh, less popular until the invention of the, the perceptron. And then the connectionists sort of took over and they were very interested in how we could use neural networks to represent the brain. Then sort of the 90s, 80s, not much going on again. This, these are referred to as the winters of AI. And what's really um, important for us is that somewhere in the early 2000s, there was, we awoke from the last AI winter and um, this was due to a number of factors. And these factors are not just important for AI, equally for data science, which I think are two very related fields. Um, what we didn't have you know, in the 70s was a lot of data. So now we have data from the internet, we have big storage facilities, everybody has a ton of photos on their cell phone, so we have big data. Okay, we also have the means to process this big data. We have powerful graphical processing, processing units, GPUs, and this is especially important in this class because GPUs uh, are exactly what we leverage when we do convolutional neural networks, which imply doing a lot of matrix multiplications, which is exactly a, an operation done on the GPU. Okay. Then thirdly, what we have is some very important ev evolutions in the field of deep neural networks. More importantly, CNNs, which came uh, about about 10-ish years ago. Okay. And so this empowers us to do something with this big data on these powerful GPUs. Okay, so I'm not going to go into this with you again, because I'm sure you see this in machine learning and uh, earlier uh, in this class as well, but neural networks basically represent the perceptron model, which for each node, you have a number of inputs and it goes through um, pointwise multiplication and an activation function. Okay. And it has enabled us to um, go one step further into convolutional neural networks. Okay. So when we have neural networks, what we do to go into deep neural networks is basically we stack multiple hidden layers. Okay. They can be of different sizes and if you, the premises is if you give enough training data, then the neural network can approximate very complex functions that map data, input layer, onto the output layer, okay, which are your predictions or your decisions. Okay. Now, you've all seen this person, I would assume, Jan Le Kuhn, which is basically the founding father of convolutional neural networks, who is now chief AI scientist at Facebook. So we'll be talking about the name, you'll see the name Le Le Kuhn or Jan come back later in this lecture and I'll point out what are the, the things that he invented. Okay, so convolutional neural networks, as per Jan's definition, are a specialized kind of neural network for processing data that has a known grid-like topology. Okay, so we can, this can include time series data, which is a 1D grid, so it can also be words or sentences. Um, it can be image data, which is a 2D grid. It can even be videos, which is a 3D grid, but it's a little bit more complex, okay? Um, so convolutional neural networks have been tremendously successful in practical application, right? Uh, the name convolution comes because it employs a mathematical operation called a convolution. So it's a type of linear operation that we'll be practicing later in this lab, sorry, in the lecture. So we call a convolutional neural network one that uses at least one layer of these convolutional uh, operations. Okay, so a CNN, you feed it an image and it will make a prediction, prediction in this case a sentiment prediction. Okay. 
they are really everywhere. So some of these examples that I mentioned before, object detection, uh, segmentation, uh, which you see here again, um, all using image, pre uh, sorry, CNNs. Okay. Now, there are some very interesting advances that allow us to put CNNs even in self-driving cars because NVIDIA um, has been inventing these um, amazing GPUs. So we see a Tesla card here, which is a high-end card that we have in our lab servers, for instance. Uh, but NVIDIA has also created the Jetson cards, which are basically low-powered devices that can be plugged into IoT devices, which is uh, pretty amazing. So it allows us to, to really tinker and make real products with GPU power. All right, here's another famous example. I believe this is the open pose library at the top here, uh, which is doing deep learning for real time pose estimation. So remember how you used to be able to use the Kinect, which has an infrared scanner to get the depth information and the skeleton representation of yourself. Well, these days you can use something like open pose, which is a library based on CNNs to estimate your joints and your skeleton and it works pretty decently. There are some other examples here. At the bottom is a computer game that uses some offline Monte Carlo tree search planning, but the input is processed using convolutional neural networks. So it's really taking the screen as input. More examples, um, again, for self-driving cars, we have um, the traffic signs. Or the image at the bottom left is a rotation invariant convolutional neural network for galaxy morphology prediction. Okay, so measuring the morphological parameters of galaxies is a key requirement for studying their formation and evolution. So surveys such as the Sloan Digital Key Survey have resulted in the availability of very large collections of images, which have permitted population-wide analyses of uh, galaxy morphologies. Okay. Usually this is done by visual uh, examination by experts, but uh, this is very time consuming and does not scale well. Okay. So the Galaxy Zoo project applied a crowdsourcing approach to label a certain amount of images and then from there they developed the CNN network. Here's another uh, Kaggle challenge which is on whale recognition from tons and tons of ocean data. Where are whales being spotted? This helps in the whale conservation project so that they can track their migration cycles and see, uh, study some of their behavioral patterns. Right, so here's an example of image captioning, which is where uh, you give an image to your neural network and then you try to predict this textual description of what is happening in the, uh, in the, the image. So on the left, we have a, a perfectly errorless prediction, a white teddy bear sitting in the grass, a man riding a wave on top of a surfboard. Perfect. Some minor errors in the center, a man in a baseball uniform throwing a ball, almost a very subtle difference, a cat sitting in a suitcase on the floor. Uh, it's not really a floor, but it's pretty good. Somewhat related, a woman is holding a cat in her hand. Okay. A woman standing on the beach holding a surfboard, almost correct. Okay, so there's still some work to be done. Also, this is work from 2015, this is five years ago. Um, but it's pretty, it's pretty solid uh, work. And it's a very interesting task as well, not easy at all. Okay. Another uh, application of CNNs is more in the generative models, uh, which is something that we discuss in the AI class. It's not really for data science, uh, but I want to mention it that you can use CNNs uh, to represent your images what you do with it, what kind of complicated AI model you use with them can be totally up to you. So here, um, I think they use the pix to pix network, which is a uh, type of generative adversarial network to do style transfer and transfer these photos into the style of a famous painter. Okay. All right, how does it work? First of all, let's have a look at how an image looks like. We usually have three layers in, a, in an image. It's basically a matrix of pixels, and it has three matrices of pixels, one for red, green, and blue. Okay. So this is represented in an image as three channels. These layers are called channels. 
and overlaying these three these three channels over one another gets you the actual image. So we're dealing with matrices of double numbers, you know, double floating numbers. So how is a black and white image usually represented? If for black and white, we don't have floating values. We only have zeros or one. And I'm so sorry, usually the ones is actually the light ones and the zero is the black. So I got that mixed up here, but I think you understand the gist. So um, before we had convolution, how does it work? I showed you the equation of the neural network. We have each pixel value, basically an original value of a 24-bit color image. That means we have 8 bits per color, so 256 values per bit for each of the channels means we have a total of 16 million colors that we can represent. So to pre-process the color values, usually we normalize everything between 0 and 1. Having something normalized in a neural network typically will increase your performance. Okay. So before we go into how convolution works, how does it work in a normal neural network? So when we take a color image, 300 by 300 pixels, okay, that's pretty tiny, right? That means we would have 300 by 300 the dimensions times three channels input values which equals to 270,000 inputs okay so one dimensional vector here of length 270k is inputted in the network for a simple 300 by 300 image okay so if we say we reduce the number of uh, nodes in our first layer we have a thousand hidden nodes so that means we reduce our data from 270,000 to 2,000 nodes divided by 270 which is small we need about 270 million parameters or weights to train uh, in order to train the neural network with only this first layer okay Think about that, 270 million parameters to train one layer neural network with a tiny input image size. Okay. This becomes a high chance of overfitting because your network simply is too complex. Right, so what is the solution? Convolution. It drastically reduces the number of parameters that we need to learn, and this is key. So I want you to remember this. Uh, convolution is way more efficient, you have way more weights to train, so that enables us to train much deeper networks. Okay. In addition, it preserves locality. So whenever you have dimensions and um, relations within your image to be learned, then uh, this convolution will help you do that. So in, in for instance, in this pix in this image here, these white things, they signify something, the fact that they occur together. So knowing that this pixel here is right next to a pixel there is important for the network. And that's something that you would lose if you were just to flatten the, 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 to flatten the image into one dimension. Okay, so we're going to go into how a typical, a traditional, standard, not deep neural network, convolutional neural network looks like. So we have input images, notice three channels, red, green, blue. Um, we start with a convolution with the ReLU activation, I'll talk about that, and pooling, I'll talk about that. Then this is repeated in the most simple form, it's repeated once but you can repeat it as many times as you want. Then we still have a multidimensional image as output, so we flatten it into a one-dimensional vector. It goes through a fully connected dense layer, normal neural network layer, and it has the final output prediction. In this case, it is a classification problem, so we use a softmax activation. I believe you should have learned this uh, with Suyan Ya. So convolutional layer, how does that work? So we're going to, if you look at this image here, we are going to be dissecting this part and we start with convolution. How does it work? 
So we have an input image that looks zeros and ones. I simplified it. Uh, and it's going to go to through a convolution to create something called feature maps. Okay. And to do that, we don't just do a pairwise multiplication, pointwise multiplication like we do in a neural network. We actually do convolution using, using filters or kernels. It's another word for filters. Okay. And these kernels or filters, these are what replaces our weights. So we learn how the filter looks like. That is what we need to train. Okay. So uh, how does this convolution operation looks like? For a 2D image H and a 2D kernel F, so our filter F and an image H, we have a convolution operator that looks um, like this. It's basically a multiplication, uh, fairly standard multiplication. I'll go over this in the next slide so it becomes uh, clear. However, there's something that we should uh, take into account here. Actually, Oh, so first I should say this is discrete. If you want to do this continuously, you just take the integral so it becomes the uh, summation over infinite uh, elements. If you do this convolution, whereby you multiply basically the image with the kernel f and you shift the elements, then um, you actually, that's actually not what we're doing. This is what we're doing in, neural, in the neural network convolutional layer is in fact cross-correlation. And the definition of cross-correlation, which is often represented with this symbol, is slightly different. The only difference there is, is the sign here. So the end result is basically that the filter, the resulting filters are flipped. That is the only issue. So why do we do cross-correlation instead of convolution? Because it makes it um, more efficient to, to execute. So there's no reason why we should do this flip action. So we're just, we're just doing, uh, we're doing this cross-correlation. Okay. Well, I should note I and J here are, of course, uh, the positions in the resulting image map. Each time the filter shifted to calculate the next point. I will explain this formula. There's nothing as uh, uh, clear to explain it as an example. So let's go over an example. You do not need to memorize these formulas. Okay. Right. So what we have is our input, our filter, and our feature resulting feature map. Let's take the example. For ease of calculation and for the example I did not normalize these values so normally they'd be between 1 and 0 uh, but to make calculation easier to demonstrate convolution I'm just going to put it like this okay so we have our um, image and we are using a filter now how do we go about to calculate the convolution it's basically you take, uh, so you overlay the filter over the original image, and then you calculate the product of each element, which each element of the filter. Three times one, plus one times one, plus two times one, plus zero times zero, plus five times zero, etc., etc., resulting in the new element in your feature map. Then we shift our overlaid filter, our window, a little bit, uh, and we do the same thing again. Mm -hmm. uh, you can calculate it, it should be correct. And we shift it again. Here we have a hop size of one. Hop size is how much we shift it each time. We can set it to be larger as well. And this would be the resulting feature map. So this is an example of um, an edge detection kernel or filter. Okay. So this particular filter will do edge detection. Okay. So in case, uh, in, in case our input image looks like this, okay. one side colored, one side not. And we calculate the convolutions. So we can calculate the convolution of the first element. Uh, oh, first we overlay it like this. And we calculate 10 plus 10 plus 10 minus 10 plus 10 
will be zero. Okay. Only when we enter the sort of central area will we have values that activate only these and zeros for these. So that means the resulting feature map looks a little bit like this. What does it do? It highlights where the uh, edge is, right? Our input image looked something like this. If we assume that the zero values are bright, it is an image that is half dark and half white. So if we do edge detection, what do we want to detect? We want to detect and say there is an edge here, which is exactly what this feature map does. Okay. What we're going to see in convolutional neural networks is that automatically all sorts of useful filters are learned, and this is very exciting. So I'll show some examples in a little bit, but if you do face detection, you'll see that there's a filter learned for like curves of the mouth and different types of noses. Um, so that's actually quite, quite nice. And in the shallower layers, we'll see simple filters like edge detection. And the deeper you go, the more complex the filters become and they become real features of humans, for instance. Okay. Right. So um, that brings us to the feature map or activation map. Okay. When we have this original image, for instance, three channels, and we multiply it by a filter, also has channels, then we get one activation map or feature map. Uh, there's a few ways that you can call it. Okay. So if you convolve over all spatial locations, for each filter, you will get a different activation map. So if you have six features here, sorry, six filters here, you will get six activation maps. Okay. So if you look at ConvNet, basically that is a series of convolutional layers interspersed with activation functions, ReLU activation functions. Note that each time you perform convolution, you slightly decrease the dimensions of the feature map. Okay. Um, also, depending on the number of filters you use, if you use six filters, you have six channels here, you use um, six filters, sorry, 10 filters, then you have 10 uh, channels here. So the dimensions change a bit. Here's an animation of how the convolutional uh, operation happens if you have three channels in your Im image. So for each time we do our sliding window, we got one element uh, from the convolutional operation. And for each new filter, we get a new uh, layer or channel in our resulting feature map. So here's some examples from typical filters uh, that have actually been learned by convolutional neural networks. You see that there's some edge detection going on and uh, changes between uh, specific colors. So one filter always results in one activation map. Okay. So here are some examples of uh, five by five filters, which result in these uh, feature activation maps. Okay. More cool examples. Uh, as I mentioned, low level features are edge detection. Very often, if we go deeper, we see actual uh, outlines of eyes, noses, etc. And if you go really to deep, the deepest parts of your network, you can find real actual faces and very, very uh, clear, uh, clear features. Okay. So in this example, it came from, uh, this is a slide from NVIDIA. This came from uh, an application whereby we had face identification. Okay. So it was trained on 10 to 100 million images and it had hundreds of layers with one billion of parameters. Okay. So let's look at the dimensions uh, of the image or the feature maps within a convolutional neural network. Let's say we have a seven by seven input and we use a three by three filter, which is overlaid here. If we uh, do a stride of one, 
our resulting feature map will be, can you guess? And we do one, one, three, four, five. So I am guessing five by five. Okay, here it goes. A five by five output. Okay, I didn't draw it. So if you have a seven by seven input, but you use a stride of two, meaning your hop size is two, you have a smaller output, right? This time you jump a bit more and you have a three by three output. What if you have a stride of three? Okay, so my overlaid, I s jump three, one, two, three, there and I jump three one two three oh my goodness uh, that does not work so sometimes you run into trouble and this is why with convolutional neural networks even if you use a nice fast AI or Keras you always have to think a little bit about dimensions so it's important that you can calculate dimensions okay. so there's a little formula that you can use which is basically um, the, the input image size n minus the filter size divided by the stride plus one. Okay, that'll give you the resulting output dimensions. What do we do? So, just to show you this diamond, uh, this formula, if we have stride one, seven minus three divided one plus one equals five by five output. Remember, three by three output, and here we don't have an integer number which causes trouble. Luckily, there is a simple way to deal with this. Uh, we can just add some padding or zero padding around our image. And if we add one padding row or all around the image, we can now have a um, nicely uh, integer output dimension size. Okay. Another reason why you want to add this padding is to preserve your um, input dimension size. Okay, so let's say um, if you have a seven, if your input is seven by seven, you have a three by three filter, stride size one, your output would become five by five. But if you apply one padding, then actually you preserve the input size of seven by seven. So where were we in our general overview? We have convolution and it is followed by ReLU. ReLU has done or applied in neural networks. It is a nonlinear activation function. Okay, so we see um, we see nonlinear activation functions to actually empower the neural network to perform nonlinear operations. So that's one of the strengths. You can't really represent the relationship between an image and uh, this is Sonia, as in face recognition, by a linear line. You need to have some complexity in there. So the way we do that is very popular and it often performs very well is ReLU, which basically looks like this. It is zero until zero and then it's just um, x, y is x. Other possibilities are uh, tan h, uh, sigmoid, or uh, there are some other uh, newer options as well. Okay, so experiment which activation function works best in your network. Mm -hmm. Then, if you look back to the image, we had convolution, we had activation function, and then we have a pooling layer. So pooling is often done to do downsampling to simplify the output of the convolutional uh, layer. So pooling reduces the size of the representation. This is good sometimes if you want to speed up the computation as well as make the detected features a little bit more robust. Okay, So you make things a little bit more vague so you can deal with them better. You have less parameters. Two types of pooling that are very popular, max pooling, average pooling. Uh, and a typical shape of the pooling is two by two or four by four. Okay, If your window becomes too big, you're going to lose a lot of information. Okay, um, So also non-overlapping windows perform best. So your hop size will typically be the same 
as your uh, pooling size. Max pooling. So you see here that there's non-overlapping windows. If we do pool, that means for each time we overlap the pooling, uh, we do uh, the, the pooling window, sorry, we uh, calculate one number for each of these things. So max pooling takes the maximum number, average pooling takes the average number, uh, 13 here, 20 here. It's pretty standard. Okay. Okay. So this is nothing to learn, no weights to be trained. They only reduce the size by averaging or taking the maximum. There are, however, some hyperparameters that you need to set. What right? is the pooling size window? What is the stride size? Non-overlapping typically works best, but you never know for your problem. So it, with a neural network, of course, uh, should be said, always perform some experiments to test your hyperparameter settings. Okay. So how many nodes do you use? Have you tried a ridiculously amount, uh, a huge amount of nodes? ridiculously small amount of nodes, something in between, try a few values, set up a nice experiment to see what works best. Okay. And then finally, so we had convolution, activation layer, pooling. Finally, we flatten it after we're done with all the convolutions and we've repeated this, we flatten the layer. Actually, let me just go back to this image here. So we do convolution repeat that as many times as you want, then we are at the flatten stage. Okay. Okay. Flatten is pretty simple. You just change the shape of the vector. And then finally, we have a fully connected layer. So now we're back to one dimensional vectors, normal neural network. So typically you add with one or two or more fully connected layers. Okay. It's called a fully connected layer because all of the inputs have connections to all of the nodes. Okay. Just a simple normal neural network. What do you use as your training laws then finally? So you could use depending on your task here. So, Remember, it's data science. We shouldn't keep, uh, shouldn't lose track of what we're trying to do here. Doing image classification, so that means I can use uh, cross entropy loss with a softmax activation. That is often used if you're trying to predict multiple classes. Okay, with one class at a time, but out of multiple classes. Okay. Um, you can use sigmoid cross entropy loss uh, for binary classification. A little bit easier or Euclidean loss for if you're doing regression. So for instance, mean squared error. Mm -hmm. So here's an example, softmax. What you do uh, in the lab, we'll do some image classification dogs versus cats. And uh, we use the, so uh, sorry, we use the softmax function here, which speaks for itself. Uh, and we get probabilities for each of the classes. In this case, it's clearly a dog. Usually the cut up is 0 0.5, especially with binary classes. All right, so how does this work in Keras? Luckily, very easy. So what you'll see in the lab is that um, we can define these generator uh, functions, okay, which are very cool because they do a, no a bunch of functions for us all at the same time. So in this case, in the lab, we call it training generator and it uses data gen flow from directory. So basically you put all of the images of a certain class, each in a folder with a class name, and then it can automatically transform all of the images into your desired fixed width and height, because as you know, Convolution actually always takes a fixed input uh, resolution size. Okay. Uh, you define a batch size, which will be used to train the, later, the, the neural network in batches later, so that the gradient descent optimizes per batch. And then you say the class mode is binary here because we have two classes. Okay. Pretty easy. And, um, and when we get to the data augmentation section, we can easily add some commands to the training generator uh, to automatically do data augmentation. This is pretty cool. 
So how do we go about it? It's a sequential model. And we just, when we define our model, we just add convolutional layers here, a two dimensional convolution, which we need because our images are 2D. We define our input shape, resolution of the images, three channels. Um, we add our activation and our pooling with a pooling of size two by two. All pretty standard. Okay. Convolution, there's some more parameters here. We have a filter size of three by three. And I believe 32 filters. Yeah, 30, 32 filters or kernels. Then you repeat this as many times as you want. Of course, the input shape always changes to the output shape of the last command here. Uh, after you're done with the convolution, you just flatten the model, add a fully connected or dense layer of 64 nodes. Again, you do some nonlinear activation here. We add dropout. Dropout serves, which I hope you saw in the neural network lecture, dropout serves to regularize your network, so to help prevent overfitting, means some of the nodes in the fully connected layer are actually going to be set uh, to zero. Okay, so we lose a little bit of information deliberately. Uh, and then finally, a dense uh, layer going to one because we have binary classification with sigmoid activation. That's pretty simple and a huge improvement over how traditionally neural networks were defined in uh, Python. Okay, so finally, we can compile our model using defining the loss, the binary cross entropy. You define an optimizer, it can be Adam optimizer, IMS prop. Uh, that's not the goal of this class, more on this in the AI course or the machine learning course. And then you use your metric that you want to optimize, in this case, accuracy, because it's a binary classification. All right, so then we are ready to fit the model which is Keras for train the model. So uh, as our input, we have the train generator function, which was the first one I talked about. Then we have the steps per epoch, which means basically um, the number of training samples per batch size. So the number of, um, the number of batches, right? The number of epochs, an epoch is how many times do you look through your entire data set? This one here is pretty cool because it allows you to visualize the history, the training history of uh, your uh, network training so that you can create nice plots later. Um, not to forget, I all too often see people show the evolution of their loss function on their training data, which is great. But what I really want to see is how um, your evaluation data, training data or validation, sorry, test data or validation data performs. Because um, if you're doing overfitting, your training loss is going to go like this. And you're going to tell me my network worked perf perfectly. And then you, I give you some new data, validation or training data, and your loss will go like this. That means you are overfitting. Okay, It works. Your network is overly trained to work well for your training data, but not for newly unseen data. Okay, so important to add this. Cool, this is the basics of uh, convolutional neural networks. Okay, now we want to perform actual tasks. We want to do, we want to get results and be able to leverage what exists to get results fast and efficiently. So that's why I want to go over some famous pre-built networks with you. As a data scientist, um, you'll probably be using some very high level software like FastAI or Keras, and you just want to load um, pre-trained networks, okay? And do something which we refer to as transfer learning. More on transfer learning in a little bit. Okay, what is a network that revolutionized uh, this field of computer vision. 
First, we have Lynette in 1998. Lynette, remember the le here? That refers to Jan Le Kuhn, our uh, Facebook chief AI scientist. And it was developed on the MNIST dataset. I'm sure you've seen this dataset before, but it is basically handwritten digits that were um, gathered from the US Post Office for uh, automatic sorting of zip postal codes. Okay. So this uh, small network took as input a 32 by 32 image, tiny, tiny sized image, uh, did some convolution, did some pooling, which we call subsampling here. It's a, some sort of average pooling with some learnable weights per feature map. Uh, don't worry about the details about that. Another convolution, pooling, fully connected layer, fully connected layer, and then uh, some Gaussian uh, final, layer, final output prediction. Number of parameters, 60,000. Keep that in mind as a reference to the other networks. It actually worked pretty well on this uh, dataset MNIST, which we'll go into uh, details later on. AlexNet, uh, we're skipping a few years in time here. Uh, we're going to 2012. This is 14 years further in time. Uh, when we're noticing the emergence of deep learning. Mm -hmm. AlexNet uh, is basically a considerably larger architecture than the original the net. However, the architecture is very sim similar. <coughs> Sorry. We have pooling convolution, pooling max pooling convolution, etc. Uh, it is a lot deeper. It has seven hidden layers, which was quite revolutionary for the time. Now it's like seven layers. Is it a deep neural network? And it has 60 million parameters, which is quite a lot. Okay. So um, <clears throat> this network was presented in the ImageNet competition, which is sort of the, the benchmark in computer vision. It has uh, 1.2 million training images of a thousand classes. And I'll be going over some of these famous CNN networks, all based on the ImageNet competition. They all participated. This competition is sort of the place to uh, bring out and benchmark new uh, CNN architectures. Two years later, the VGG network, VGG16, uh, offers an even deeper but simpler variant. It has 16 convolutional layers and it's extremely homogeneous. It's an architecture that performs only three by three convolutions followed by two by two pooling from the beginning to the end. So at each convolution pooling, basically the image or feature map is cut in half, which you can see here on the image. So each operation cuts it in half because of the two by two pooling. Mm -hmm. The number of parameters is 138 million. For a network that's about more than twice as deep as the um, AlexNet from the previous slide, which had 60 million, uh, it's actually not, not bad. Okay. The good thing is if in Keras you want to apply this model, it's super easy. Okay. Uh, there's these built-in functions that says call model VGG16 and even better set the weights to the weights that won the ImageNet competition. Amazing, right? So you can just use this as a feature selection on your images. Okay. So if you do something like this, what you basically do is you, do, uh, you use a pre-trained network. One step further is if you make these weights not fixed, that means you do transfer learning. You start with pre-trained weights, but then you allow these weights to be retrained or trained further or fine-tuned to your task at hand. That's what we call transfer learning. Okay. Uh, another one. The same year, we have Google Lunette, um, which is uh, also called Inception. It was also developed for the ImageNet competition by Google. And it performs a series of convolutions at different scales. What does that mean? We have our input image here. And then we say, we're not just going to apply five 
three by three filters. No, we're going to do one one by one filter, one by one filter, a three by three filter, etc. So different filters of different resolutions. Okay. Then in the end, everything is aggregated again. Okay. So if you look at the huge uh, overall network, because this is very deep, we have these things that they call inception cells, whereby the images split up in different resolution convolutions and the result is aggregated. Mm -hmm. So these uh, parallel paths that we see here are really, with, with different receptive field sizes, are really meant to capture sparse patterns of correlations in the stack of feature maps. Okay. ResNet, super famous network, which was the ImageNet competition the year after, uh, is an even more deep network. So it ranges from tens to hundreds of uh, layers. A uh, popular one is ResNet 50, but you have ResNet 100, ResNet 15, etc. as well. So the thing is, does more layers always increase the performance? No, right? After a certain time, you don't have enough data or the, the layers just start having a negative effect on the part on the performance because your original image degradates too much, right? Even though we have better parameter initialization techniques now and some techniques like batch norm that allows for deeper networks to converge, uh, this, these techniques are like um, for the AI course, let's not worry about this. Um, deeper networks are often high, harder to converge okay so this degradation problem is solved by using resnet resnet includes something called residual blocks so in the intermediate layers of a block it learns a residual function with reference to the block input this identity function basically passes along the input of the at the beginning of the block to the end of the block and it adds it to that if we look at the mathematical function that means that y here is equal to the result of multiple convolutions which is uh, fx plus the original input of the residual network okay what's often done because there is a change of the dimensions when you go through the convolutions it is scaled up a little bit uh, by a, a, a weighing scaling factor okay so don't, don't worry about the mathematics of that too much but the main idea is that in the residual blocks you have this passing of the identity function and it's added to the output of the block okay so this prohibits you from losing information as you go deeper into the network Okay, so ResNet is really deep. ResNet 50 has about 25 million parameters. That is not a lot compared to what we've seen before. Okay. Did you see, do I remember correctly, VGG 16 has about 160-ish million parameters. Okay, so it's doing really well. And the less parameters you have, the less hard it is to train. Okay, here in this image, each colored block is basically uh, a series of convolutions of the same dimension. And the feature mapping is periodically downsampled by strided convolution. So if you stride, if you skip when it was higher, your dimensions of your output feature map goes down, go down. And it has an increase in channel depth. So more channels, so more filters to, pre to still preserve the time complexity per layer. Um, and then we have all of these skip connections, which basically uh, pass the identity function so that information doesn't uh, go, go lost. So if we look at this ImageNet competition, ILSVRC, uh, we see the depth of the network. And this basically goes over time, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14, 15. Uh, this is the error 
lower the better. This was before the area of deep learning, whereby never better, nobody ever achieved a better error than this over many, many years that the competition was running. All of a sudden, AlexNet comes along with eight layers, achieves almost half of the error rate, which was a very uh, noticeable uh, thing. Then we, we have uh, the VGG-ish, again, cut in half the error rate, Google-Net, ResNet, etc. Okay. So we're going from shallow to eight layers, 19, 22, 50 layers with ResNet. Okay. Um, here again, just different representation. The precision instead of the error rate goes up using deep neural networks a lot. So we have ResNext, which is uh, very much inspired by Inception, but basically it, they follow a split transform merge paradigm. Okay. So in this, uh, the authors introduced this factor called cardinality, which is basically the number of independent paths that you split into. And um, we always still pass the identity function. The difference here though, is that it's not added but it's depth concatenated. So it's added as another channel to your output instead of just being added to your result. Okay. There's also dense net. Dense net, we have dense connections. So the idea is that it may be useful to reference feature maps from earlier in the network. Okay. So, um, very much like ResNet, except you have way more references here. It is a densely connected network over time, okay, or, or over depth. Okay. Again, uh, each la layer's feature map is um, concatenated, so depth concatenated uh, together. It has an even better performance with less complexity, and it's based on the ResNet architecture. So it's based on the ResNet architecture because of this identity connections, which happen way more frequently within the block right now, and they're concatenated versus added together. So one thing uh, that happens is they, this network tackles the uh, gra gradient, vanishing gradient problem uh, very well. So it allows us to train much deeper networks quite efficiently. Looking at the parameters, it's quite low. For a 100 layer dense net, we only have 0.8 million parameters that need to be trained, which is uh, very, very well. Looking at uh, the ImageNet competition uh, from 2020, we see quite some evolutions. So we have talked about a lot of these networks. Now we have here on the x-axis the number of parameters in millions. So that means the lower, the better. And then we have the accuracy. So here it's the highest, the better. So where you want to be, is in the top left corner. And what we see there, while Inception has low parameters, so as ResNet, DenseNet, um, one that jumps out is EfficientNet. So let's have a little look at EfficientNet, different versions of EfficientNet. So EfficientNet really is based on the principle that uh, we can do different scaling methods within a network. So we can have width scaling, where we change the node. Uh, we can have depth scaling or resolution scaling. Uh, and what, what EfficientNet does is compound scaling. So it can be very hard to figure out how to scale your network and set your hyperparameters. Basically, EfficientNet solves this by uh, saying that we need to use one uniformly scaled uh, method. So we do scaling on all different levels using one scaling uh, component or one scaling factor. And uh, it uses a grid search methodology, which we saw in one of the earlier uh, lectures uh, related to SVM, to find the relationship between different scaling dimensions of the baseline network under a fixed resource constraint, which will be your flops or the computing power of your um, machine. So it'll find an appropriate scaling coefficient for each of the dimensions using grid search. 
So just to elaborate a little bit about the types of scaling, with scaling basically means the um, number of channels, channels that you get in your feature maps. Depth scaling will be the number of layers in your network and resolution scaling basically simply is um, the, uh, the number of pixels in your image. So the height and width of your image. So the result is a carefully balanced network depth, width and resolution, which can lead to a better performance. So we basically call this field automatic machine, automated machine learning, meaning that you learn how to build your model, how your model should look like, what the high para parameters of your model need to be uh, using machine learning already. So um, this new scaling method uniformly scales all the dimensions of dip width depth, width, and resolution using a simple but very efficient compound coefficient. Okay. So it's a very structured scaling. So in the efficient net paper, there's not only this new scaling method, there's also a new baseline network proposed, which optimizes both the accuracy and the efficiency in terms of floating flops, floating points operation per second of your uh, algorithm on your machine. So this is basically um, consists of MB conf blocks, which is mobile inverted bottleneck convolutions, similar to mobile net version, version two, which I won't go into detail, but it's slightly larger. So um, how does this uh, MB conf look like? If we look at a normal residual block, it goes from wide to narrow to wide. So the output is scaled back to the input size so that X can be added to it. So um, in residual blocks, remember that we have the identity function here. So we perform a convolution, which typically reduces our input size, but we perform a convolution such that we can get it back to the same size and add it here. In inverted resi residual blocks, we basically go from narrow to wide to narrow, which is the opposite of the residual block. So it initially takes a low dimensional input and expands it with a one by one convolutional layer, followed by a three by three depth wise convolution and back to the input shape uh, using a one by one convolutional layer so that it can be added um, using uh, added to the uh, identity function. All right, so uh, the resulting uh, efficient net performs extremely well in the ImageNet competition. And uh, these uh, variants B1, B4, B5 are used, are obtained using different scaling coefficients. So the hyperparameter tweaking is important. Okay. So if you want to read a little bit more on all these variants, they change all the time. Uh, this is a nice article on Medium that you can refer to. Now let's have a look at uh, the Hello World example from convolutional neural networks, which is based on the MNIST dataset of 100 digits. Uh, I mentioned this dataset before, it's gathered in the US post office and it was meant to help automate the sorting based on zip codes. Okay, Jan LeCun created this dataset and uh, there are 28 by 28 grayscale images with pixel values from zero to 255. Uh, the data set is 60K, 60,000 training examples and 10K test samples. Okay, so quite a small data set. And the output obviously is an integer from zero to nine, the number. So let's implement Lynette for MNIST. Uh, I did this for you and uh, we did convolution pooling convolution pooling and then two fully connected layers uh, but the, with the uh, binary cross entropy if i run this then basically what do i see i see first that the loss function the training which is the blue line goes down nice and smooth which we expect the validation loss i used part of the training set to validate uh, also goes down uh, however, oh, yes, and the accuracy of the validation set goes up. Excellent. Looks good, right? Looks good. I feed it a test image, and what do I get? The prediction uh, probabilities for each class. Two has the highest probability. 
so we say it's a 2. 0 also has a high probability, but it's okay. It's still easily to distinguish. So I feed it a bunch of numbers, and let's see. Um, it says it has 96% classification accuracy, but let's have a look. It classifies correctly this one, this one, this one. But these are all misclassified. Any ideas why? Well, let's see. We didn't train on the full data set, so let's take uh, the full data sets. What I did is I trained on a smaller data set to make sure that I could fine tune my architecture a lot and run the model a lot quicker. This is a nice practice to do uh, when you're developing something. On the full data set, uh, I had a look at my filters, just visualize the filters, and it looks like we have some edge detection going on, diagonal detection, um, point dot detection, etc. Uh, if I look at how well the model performs predicting these images, it's not bad, um, but it's actually not really good. Okay, so we achieve 99% accuracy on our test set. But if we have these unseen images, not from the test set, we get very bad results. Basically, everything is misclassified. You could see how, right? This is predicted as an 8, sort of resembles it. This is a 2, mm, same shapes, okay, but performs poorly. Any idea why? Well, the test images were all black background, white foreground. So that is what the model is expecting. And it can deal with numbers that look slightly different, that have different backgrounds. So we can actually fix that. We do data augmentation. So this is something that, as a data scientist, you always should keep in mind, is the distribution of the test data set and the uh, training data set the same? Is this what we expect to see in real life? What could be the problems with our data and how could we change it. Okay. So when we have um, these different backgrounds, it doesn't work well. So one thing we could do is we could invert images. So instead of just having this, it'd be pretty easy to just do really one minus pixel value and we get this white and black one. Let's train it on double the data set and see how it performs. This is our old results. These are the new results. Amazing. Just the 8 has some trouble with, but that's understandable. We probably have to do some more augmentations to make that work. So not having labeled data with these backgrounds, with these white backgrounds, still it performs pretty well. So you could do some other augmentations, maybe uh, make adding some color in your data set. And that might increase the performance. So this one is also correctly classified. How does data augmentation happen with images? We can rotate images, shift, rescale, zoom, flip, etc. This, by the way, is an image of uh, my cat Sendai. Uh, so we'll experiment with this in the lab. And as I mentioned, the data generator earlier, uh, which is a very cool method, which allows us to, when we load the data set, just define all of the uh, possible data augmentation methods with a random factor in it. So that's amazing. All right, if you want some extra uh, tips, uh, check out this uh, article, Bag of Trips or Image Classification with CNNs uh, to get some more pointers. So I've been talking a lot about images, but uh, is convolution only for images? No, it is not. So while image processing has really been the thing that's made CNNs pop popular, anything that deals with multidimensional matrices can be used for um, uh, convolutional neural networks. So the data does not even need to be 2D. It can be applied to 1D or multidimensional data as well. For instance, video, word vectors, text processing, or even audio tasks, which is what I do in my lab. So let's have a look at audio since it's the most interesting application. So data analytics are or is important for audio. What we did, some of the research we did is uh, spoofing detection. So how, if you have a voice authentication system on your, um, in your uh, home, that 
identifies you based on your voice, sort of like face ID on your iPhone, but using your voice. We develop algorithms that can detect if somebody has recorded your voice instead of it being a real voice. We can do music genre classification, spoken word detection, which word are you saying? We can do hit prediction, speaker identification, who is talking if you know the voices of uh, 20 people. We can do emotion detection from your voice or from music. Does it sound sad or happy? All of the stuff uh, we've been doing with the Amai Lab. If you're interested in our work, check out the website uh, and look for Amai. Um, so how do we start on this? Well, we can represent audio as an image, for instance. It is a waveform. Waveform is basically a series of numbers. But it can be more informative if we use spectrograms. These are two main approaches. Uh, although there's been some uh, convolutional-based neural networks that uh, represent waveforms very well, which I'll talk about, uh, the easiest way would be to represent sound as spectrograms, basically a visual representation of the, fre the, the, the spectrum of frequencies of the sound. So for every bin, uh, so, so for every time, this is the evolution of a signal, we have frequency bins and the color will denote the intensity of that particular frequency. So here we know that something with a low frequency is being said. Okay. So to get these spectrograms, usually you have to do some Fourier analysis uh, and it gives you the distribution of power into the different frequency components on the y-axis. Okay. So this is not a signal processing course. Uh, if you're interested to, to learn more about this, you can always approach me though. Uh, but um, given that we can have a spectrogram, we can then feed it into uh, the neural network. Now we should note that there are different types of spectrograms and one that I want to point out is the MEL spectrogram. Because this MEL spectrogram basically has the frequency bins rescaled to emphasize the frequencies that the human hearing can learn, right? Uh, so it can, can hear. So uh, that's why very often uh, these MEL spectrograms perform better. Because if we're speaking, we're, and we're doing speech identification, it makes sense that a spectrogram emphasizes the tones that we hear best. Okay. Um, if you're interested to include some spectrograms in your neural network, you should check out uh, my student Raven's library, NN Audio, which basically leverages uh, neural networks to calculate spectrograms. So if we, this is a little bit uh, too deep for this class, but if you are to represent the Fourier uh, analysis as a transformation that happens within the neural network node, you can actually leverage a GPU for spectrogram calculation and calculating the spectrogram becomes the first layer of your neural network. So you can just feed it audio files instead of the images. Okay. So uh, he uses one dimensional convolution to calculate the actual spectrogram. Um, that being said, once you have the spectrogram, you can just feed it into uh, a convolutional neural network and it has been done for things like genre classification, audio simulation, similarity measures, etc. Et okay. So in this slide, I still have a uh, Librosa in here, which has a simple mouse spectrogram uh, function. You can, even if you're using Keras, you can use NN Audio to uh, get a similar dot spectrogram function to get the spectrogram out of here. Uh, just check out the GitHub, there's very nice tutorials on there. So once you have the spectrograms, you can use it for speech recognition. For instance, in a study done by Abdel Hamid in 2014, uh, they have spectrogram input, then different convolutional layers, max pooling, fully connected layers, uh, to uh, identify to identify which word is being said. Okay. So then the network is identified using something called the word error rate and it has the network itself has one convolution to fully connected layers, etc etc. And they compare it to a deep neural network when it outperforms it, especially if they use pre-training, so pre-trained neural networks. 
There is music emotion classification, also done by spectrogram. You have your audio here, convolution, pooling, etc, etc. Here we use four convolutional layers and it just can um, predict 18 different emotion tags. Now, um, if you want to represent audio in a slightly different way, also based on spectrograms, you can use pre-trained neural network, just like the pre-trained neural networks from the ImageNet competition, like you get ResNet50 based on ImageNet, you can get VGG pre-trained on AudioSet. AudioSet is a huge data set uh, released by Google, which is basically um, has about 1 million images of 1,000 different classes or something. I forget the exact number, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I can display it for you here. And um, the VGG-ish model basically provides 128 dimensional embedding for audio based on a pre-trained model for using the audio set data set. Okay. So it's sort of like word embeddings. You feed it a word, you get a word to vac embedding. You feed it an audio file, you get a VGG -ish embedding. Okay. So this particular VGG is, is a variant using 11 layers. And the changes that they made was uh, they changed the input size to f fit a log MEL spectrogram audio file. Uh, it dropped also the last group of convolutional and max pool layers. So they now have four groups of convolution and max pooling layers instead of five. Instead of a thousand white fully connected layer at the end, they use 128 white fully connected layer uh, that can act as the embedding layer. You can download it here. It's very easy to load it into your network. So we've seen one possible way of representing audio using a spectrogram and then possibly a pre-trained deep neural network to represent that spectrogram. Now let's have a look at the other possibilities of using the waveform instead of the spectrogram. Now first to do this, let me talk about a, a recent uh, invention or a recent novel uh, architecture called the Temporal Convolutional Neural Network which is basically a convolutional neural network made for time series. The TCN can take a series of any length and output it as the same length. Okay. But the output at length T is only convolved with elements that occurred before T, t uh, through something that they call dilated convolutions. This is a one-dimensional convolution, okay, typically, in its most basic form. So we have as input a time series here and so we have time one, two, three, four, etc. And at time t, the convolution takes into account some previous elements in time, never elements that occur later in time. So these dilated convolutions uh, are set up in a hierarchical way. So they get joined later on, the output. So this is a very, in sorry, this is actually bigger like this. So this is an interesting hierarchical way of doing convolutions over time. Okay. So with this knowledge of TCNs, um, which often occurs in a decoder and an encoder path, that's the original TCN, um, we can look at something called a WaveNet. WaveNet is uh, meant to take into account relationships between waveforms, so audio files, that occur on different hierarchical levels. So we can see patterns here at a very deep level and patterns at a very zoomed out level. So this WaveNet, because it's based on temporal convolutional neural networks and these dilated hierarchical convolutions uh, allows you to take this into account. There's been some very cool results using WaveNet. Okay. So thus predictions in this way. By doing convolutions, each element with the previous elements, and then join together in a hierarchical way on a larger level. <laughs> okay, this is a bit of a challenge. Okay, right. So, so this is how WaveNet uh, works. In addition, the difference with a temporal convolutional neural network is that WaveNet, in addition, this is not shown on the blog, but in the in the GIF, but they also has uh, residual connections. So the identity matrix is also passed along at certain points so that you actually 
sometimes you keep the original uh, image and you don't lose uh, the information. That means you can go deep a lot easier. They also have gated activations, which is something that uh, you see in the LSTM course. It helps to fight the vanishing gradient uh, problem. So again, you can go deeper without risking that your um, uh, training process is impaired because your gradient gets too small. This is a small detail. So uh, WaveNet, a very powerful tool uh, to read in your data. Again, you can just load the WaveNet model or WaveNet architecture, and it can be used uh, to represent your audio data. Okay. Some of the research we, I've done in my uh, lab is a very recent paper from my PhD student Tao, uh, who created a tent effect net which is basically doing multimodal emotion classification. And just to show you that you can use these pre-trained uh, features as different multimodal inputs. So again, we're doing data science here, so we don't really want to go into VGG-ish or we want to go into WaveNet and try to improve the network. You can just leverage it. It's sort of like using libraries to load your data. You can equally just use a library like she did she had uh, movie clips and she wanted to predict the emotion of the movie clip. We have audio and video and emotion, so she used the Open Smile library to get frequency uh, spectrogram based features, not neural network related. Then she used VGG ish, pre trained on audio set to get features. Video, she used ResNet 60, sorry, ResNet 50, pre trained on ImageNet. And then she used I3D network as well, which is more uh, scene detection. So then she used FlowNet to get motion features. Oh, I2D also uh, action recognition. Okay. So using all these different features, she then fed it into self-attention transformer network, which I think you'll see in one of the, the, the next classes. Uh, self-attention, basically, she attended the network, so she, she told the transformer network to try to learn which feature to pay most attention to. And it turns out that uh, the audio features have most influence on emotion. Okay. You might think that in a movie the video influences is more, but actually the audio features have most influence. We're doing some tests now, adding a third component, which is text, and we'll see how that goes. This is still research being done right now. Okay, so the attend effect net uh, does predictions. We have the, uh, gosh, which is it? The prediction is the dotted blue line and the ground truth throughout the movie is the valence, positivity, negativity of the sentiment and the arousal, the energy of uh, the sentiment. So you see that it's not bad and it follows the overall trend. Okay. If we do the comparison of, of how it actually works, uh, this model compared to other models, we see that in terms of mean squared error, for instance, our feature attend effect net, this one, has a quite low mean squared error in terms of arousal and valence. Uh, if we compare to the model with using only audio features, audio features only model performs pretty well on its own. The model using only video features doesn't perform quite as well. Okay, so again, emphasizing the importance of audio on emotions. Okay, um, you can ignore these uh, for now. Uh, this is some state of the art that we compared with, uh, that we outperformed in terms of valence. Um, this is uh, table two shows a different data set, which uh, basically confirms pretty much our results. If you're interested in the paper, check it out it's on my website. All right, that's it for uh, this week's class. I hope you enjoyed it. In the, the lab that's to come, we're going to be experimenting with how we can implement convolutional neural networks, train them from scratch, and how we can leverage pre-trained uh, convolutional neural networks. I right, hope you enjoyed the lecture. If you have any questions, be in touch with me. I'm very happy to help you. Uh, all right, see you in class.